Hello, AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here for video number five with the chain rule. We just started to talk about taking the derivative of trigonometric functions that require the chain rule. In this particular video, we're going to look at the most challenging varieties of these kinds of problems where the trigonometric function is just complicated enough that one usage of the chain rule just won't quite get the job done. So we're going to have to use two usages of the chain rule in order to take these derivatives. And we know that two usage of the chain rules are definitely better than one. So let's go ahead and take a look at a practice problem that doesn't appear in the notes that uh, my students have, but it's going to be a way for you guys can just to sit back, look at this process before we actually tackle some of the problems in your notes. Here we go. What you're seeing here is a snippet of a video that I produced for the College Board AP Daily back in September of 2020 that dealt with taking the chain rule of a trigonometric function that required two usages. Now what you see in front of you is the simple version of the chain rule that we initially learned way back at the very beginning of my video series. And we, we know this chain rule situation, this formula to work whenever we have a inner function u and an outer function uh, y that we call it, or sometimes we might call that inner function g of x and the outer function the f of x. Now I'm going to be referring to those things as I work through this problem, so I wanted you to be a little bit conscientious of how I decide to call them and what I decide to, to, to uh, refer to them as. So let's go ahead and do a little practice. Once again, this is a problem that does not appear in the notes for my students. Just sit back watch soak this in and see if we can apply this to the next problems. So what we've got going on in the next problem is this. We are going to be looking at finding the derivative of the following function and that function is going to be uh, y uh, f of x let's say is equal to sine squared of 6 times x. So we have to think about okay well what what things are going on in this problem that are going to necessitate the usage of two versions of the chain rule. Well, as you can see, we have a 6 residing in front of the x, which that in and of itself is going to require a chain rule. But also for the first time, we have the trigonometric expression that's, in addition, raised to a power. So those two things together are going to create a little bit bigger challenge for us to take this derivative. So I want to want to return to our gum-filled lollipop analogy that I had used a little bit earlier in some previous videos. What we know is that we have this beautiful sucker, right, with this candy shell around it and the gum in the middle. But what we sometimes forget is that this sucker, when we first pick it off the shelf, has a wrapper around it. So this will be our calc pop. So as we work through a double usage of the chain rule, we're obviously going to have to pull the wrapper off the sucker, and then we can work on that candy shell around the outside, and then only then we can get to the gum-filled center. So those are going to be our three different layers and our double usage of the chain rule. And the chain rule double usage comes from the fact that we're going to be working from the wrapper to the candy, and then from the candy to the gum-filled center. So let's see what that looks like here. I'm going to go ahead and suggest, especially early on, that you rewrite the problem so that you can put the square around the outside of the sine of 6x. So we have sine of 6x quantity squared. With that, you're going to be able to better handle what you have inside and what you have on the outside. So what we've got going on here is a function raised to the second power. That's our outside part of this particular chain rule problem. So how do you take the derivative of something squared? Well, you put that 2 in front, you drop down that something, and then you make sure that you raise that something to one power less, which in this case would be the first power. And then we're going to go ahead and then know that we need to take the derivative of that something. I'm not going to worry about taking it just yet in this step. I want to set the stage for it. Next up, we're going to drop down the 2 and the sine of 6x. I don't think we really need that first power anymore. And now let's focus on the derivative of the sine of 6x. We're now at the candy-filled part of the gum, or uh, candy-filled part of the lollipop. So the derivative of the sine of 6x, well, that's the derivative of the sine of something else. So the derivative of the sine of something else would be the cosine of that same something else 
But alas, you have to remember you're going to have to multiply by the derivative of that something else. We're almost done because we're just going to drop down the previous information that we had and then focus our attention on the derivative of that something else, which was called 6x. And of course, that derivative is just simply 6. That would complete this derivative. And when you look at it a little bit more closely, what you've got is the, the wrapper in our first position multiplied by the candy shell in the middle, and then that derivative of 6x to get 6 is just our gum-filled center. And all of this can be simplified to just be uh, 12 times the sine of 6x times the cosine of 6x. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at the three problems that I have in the notes that use this same idea. So here we are with example 5, our repeated use of the chain rule. So the directions are to find the derivative of each of these trigonometric functions. And we start off with a, y is equal to the sine to the fourth power of 3x. As I mentioned before, I strongly suggest that you rewrite this so that any exponent around the trig expression can be found to the outside. And I usually will use the alternating parenthesis bracket parenthesis format to organize my work. So what I want us to do now is to recognize the fact that we are about to take the derivative of something to the fourth power. So we do our general power rule like normal, put that 4 out in front, and know that that's going to multiply by the sine of 3x, all raised to the 1 power less, which would be third power. From here, we know that we're going to be multiplying by the inside of this particular function. We're multiplying by the derivative of the sine of 3x. So that would give us the cosine of 3x. And then we finish off by multiplying by the derivative of the 3x, which in this case would be the 3. And that would finish up the derivative. Now, of course, we could rewrite this by consolidating, multiplying the 4 and the 3. The cubed with the sine could go back into its original position, if you like. It's not required that it does that. But this would give you a final derivative answer for part A. Now, these are very tricky. It does take a little bit of practice. These problems appear on the AP exam as multiple choice questions every now and then. They sometimes don't have a great success rate, but that's not because they're not they're, they're impossible to do. It's just that they take that little extra bit of practice. And once you are able to get two, three, four of these correct in a row, usually you've got it locked in. And that's a question that you can certainly bank on getting right on the AP exam in May. Let's go ahead and take a look at part B. Part B looks like a bit of a mess. We have the square root of the secant of x over 2. Yikes, lots going on there. So let's go ahead and rewrite this so that we have the secant of x over 2 in our brackets and think about what is our power going to be of the secant? Well, because there's a square root over it, that certainly could indicate that this would be raised to the one-half power. So when we take the derivative, we have to think about that first. We are taking the derivative of something to the one-half power. Well, that would, of course, give us one-half times the something secant of x over 2 raised to one power less. Now we're going to have to break out our little arithmetic knowledge of fractions and know that if we take one half and subtract one, we are going to have negative one half. But we're not finished yet because now we have to take the derivative of that something, the derivative of the secant of x over 2. Well, that would give us secant of x over 2 times tangent of x over 2. Now, if that part of this problem bothers you, it's not probably the chain rule that's giving you trouble. It's probably the fact that you're just not quite sure of your derivative facts. And that's something that is easily fixed because it just takes a little bit of hard work. You might need to break out some flashcards, make your own, uh, develop some on some kind of on online platform like uh, Quizlet or, or, or those kinds of things. But you can do that if you put the, uh, the effort forward. So now we're almost ready to finish this up, and we can take the derivative of the x over 2, which we see there, and that derivative would just be 1 half. Think of that as the derivative of 1 half times x, 
which would just, of course, give you that one half. Now, this is a, a little bit of a train wreck. It doesn't look very nice and neat. So if we multiply the halves together, we can start this off with a 1 fourth. And then I notice that these two terms, the secant of x over 2 to the negative half and the secant of x over 2 to the positive 1, can multiply together by using the algebraic rule. Whenever you multiply two like bases, you add their exponents. So we'd have secant of x over 2 raised to some power. Hmm, let's see, what is that? Negative one half plus one would be a positive one half, at which we could just probably put this over a square root. And then, of course, we have this tangent of x over 2 laying here stray, which I can just write. I don't want to make that look like it's underneath the square root, so I can kind of put a little lip on the square root. Maybe I can put a little dot in between them. Maybe even write the tangent of x over 2 before the square root, which isn't a bad idea. But I don't think we need to rewrite this problem because it seems pretty clear what's in the square root and what's not. Definitely a harder problem. I purposely wrote B so that you would have so many things going on. You had an ugly trig word, secant, you had a square root around it, and you had a fractional value after it. And I honestly believe if you can handle a double chain rule problem like part B, you pretty much can handle any kind of double chain rule. Let's take a look at C. In fact, what I would really like for you all to do is pause the video, work through C on your own, and see if you match my answer. Welcome back. Hopefully you had a little bit of success with this. Let's go ahead and rewrite this so that we have cotangent of 3x over 2 all raised to the 2 thirds power. So we didn't do anything differently. We wanted to rewrite this so that we had this fractional exponent. Next up, we're going to take our derivative. So dy over dx starts with the 2 thirds coming out to the front multiplying by our good friend the cotangent of x uh, 3x over 2 and now we would have this cotangent all raised to one power less 2 thirds minus 1 is negative 1 third our next job is to take the derivative of yet another pretty trig word cotangent of something else so we have to think the derivative of tangent is secant squared so the derivative of cotangent would be negative cosecant squared, and of course, of our 3x over 2. And then we finish by taking the derivative of the 3x over 2. Think of that as 3 halves times x, so his derivative would just be 3 over 2. And basically, your answer is correct. It probably could be cleaned up just a little bit. And if you notice that this 2 thirds in front and this 3 halves at the end are going to be multiplied together, and they're actually going to completely wipe each other out, and thus we have no coefficient. At this point, I would say we could place our fraction in here and see that this cotangent of 3x over 2 could be dropped down to the bottom. And seeing as how it would have a 1 third power now, we could just place this inside of a cubed root if we'd like. And then our negative cosecant squared would just rest up on top. While there are probably many other ways that this answer could be expressed, that's the one that I'm happy with right now. And um, I think it completes the problem the best way that we probably could. I know that this is a tough topic, and it's one, like I said before, that just requires some practice. Sometimes if you feel lost, think about the, the sucker uh, lollipop, charms, blow pop, calc pop analogy where you have the three layers, the wrapper, the candy shell, and the bubble gum. It also works very well with these wonderful peanut M&Ms, one of my favorites. You've got the hard candy shell on the outside, the chocolatey middle, and then the peanut on the inside that would kind of uh, replicate those three layers where the link between each, two of the, each of those layers would be a chain roll process. Anyway, I hope this helps. We have a couple of more videos to share with you with the chain rule that we think that can help you out a little bit, understanding this very important topic in all of calculus. So make sure you tune into those. We'll see you next time.